Good morning, everyone. Hey, there are some people awake. All right. Um, I, I'm assuming I'm just going to jump in and start. Um, I think the, the time for introductions was two weeks ago, so we're, we're just going to jump right into this. Oh, you know what, Chad? Where's the little thingy? Um, uh, while Chad gets our little thingy, uh, I'm, I'm going to, in fact, um, is, is someone still up there with you? Because I'll just have them, if you'll just forward one uh, until I get my thingy. Uh, that's the official, that's the technical term for a remote control, it's a thingy. Um, so today we've got several things we're going to go through, and um, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and apologize up front because there are a few things we're going to go through that are probably going to make a few of you kind of go, ooh, um, that, that kind of hurts a little bit. Uh, but we're just, we're just going to go that direction. So um, what I told you a couple of weeks ago I was going to hit briefly, I'm going to start with that this morning, and then we'll jump into really the substance of what we're going to discuss this morning. And that is something that occurred a little over a year ago. It uh, occurred in August of 2015. Uh, it was big news when it happened. I'm not sure how many of you even knew that a site called AshleyMadison.com existed um, prior to that. But uh, there was a, a big stink that occurred. One of the things that you need to understand is we live in an age where we have a thing that we have to fight called a data breach. Uh, data breaches are not good, okay? If you ever hear those two words together, that is not good. Uh, the average judgment uh, in a data breach case, uh, I believe, is somewhere, I, I think the last numbers I saw were somewhere around uh, $1,300 per record breached. Uh, so you start looking out over a file of, for example, 37 million records and do the math, and uh, it can be a very costly thing. So uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get churches in particular, and I'm all up in um, everybody's chili over at PV about this, and, and some of them are not terribly happy, but we got to do it. It's just uh, the times we live in. Uh, we have made some very deliberate steps over there. I'm not telling you to do it. That's up for you guys to decide. Uh, but we've made some very deliberate steps about what we will and will not do with member data because it is very different now. Um, I pulled out, I was cleaning out my office at home uh, this past summer, and I pulled out, wait for it, an old Levy Church of Christ directory, okay? And I'm not talking the old Olin Mills ones that they gave us for free if we would just go have our pictures made. No, no, no. This was the three-ring binder, that had the photocopies of hilarious directory pictures in it, uh, and it would have our names listed and the little asterisk, you know, the, the baptized asterisk, you know. As a, we, I, we used to joke in the youth group here we were going to make T-shirts with a big asterisk on it and give it to people when they got baptized. Um, but, you know, we, we have, um, if you think about it, I, I grabbed it, I thought, you know, all of this has got to be out of date, and I started to throw it away, not because I don't love you, okay, but it was so old, and the pictures were great for some laughs, uh, but then I had to put it right back in the drawer. You know why? Because we list name, address, full date of birth, phone number, basically everything I need to steal your identity is in that directory. Now, Social security is not in there, but I can work around that, okay? Here's the reality. We, it's, it's not a fault of any church. It is the sign of the times. It is what it is. And the reality is that we have got to be a lot more deliberate about what we do in our churches about how we protect information. And so at PV, now we have gone to, we don't publish any directories, okay? Okay. We just don't. We publish an online directory. It is secured, and the online directory is opt-in only, meaning the only way you can see the directory is if you agree to be in the directory, but you have to give that permission. So we're in compliance with all of that. We have a full privacy policy around that, and I think you guys do too, have a, a pretty good privacy policy. But we've taken it a step farther, and I've talked with churches literally across Arkansas and across the country about this. We have gotten to the point now we have stopped publishing without permission any maladies in a prayer list. You think about that for a second. We don't just put a prayer list out there and say, so-and-so has cancer. 
unless they have specifically said, yes, it is okay to say I have cancer. Because there's this little set of laws called HIPAA that you are in breach of if you publish that stuff. So you need to pay attention to things like that because HIPAA violations now, they used to be a fine, now they're a felony. So we've got to be very, very deliberate about that. So when I talk about data breaches, where did, did oh, did you? It's broken. it's broken? Okay, so you're, you're my remote today. All right, so keep up. Um, so last year, 37 million records were breached at this site called ashleymadison.com. Now, for those of you who do not know what this site was slash is, because it is kind of resurrecting a little bit, it was a site that guaranteed if you registered on it and you would pay money for certain credits so that you could interact with people, it would guarantee that you would have an affair within 60 days. That was their guarantee. It was the affair guarantee. If you paid a certain amount of money, they would guarantee that you would meet someone and have an affair with them. Isn't it a great time to be alive? I mean, you think about that. So, last year, 37 million records were breached. Some online hacker group got the files and then just posted it. Now, if you had been on that site, you're probably starting to sweat a little bit. And here's what ended up happening, because we dissected that, okay? And I, I will go ahead and tell you, an uncomfortable thing for me was I literally, I, I had, I counted six, six different churches who called me and said, hey, do you think we ought to look at that data and see if we have any members in that? I, I'm not making this up. And I understood the intent, but I, I had to answer it with, well, if you can get comfortable with the fact that you're using information that was gained by a felony, then that's up to you. I wouldn't do it. But company I was with, we actually got the data and sifted through it and learned some stuff from it, and I'm going to show you some of that, okay? So go ahead and move forward one, and I'll just kind of walk you through this. The number of the people in the database as a whole, males, 31.3 million. Females, 5 million. Now, let me be real clear about this, guys, okay? Women ain't looking for that like you are. It's just the reality. I've been married 26 years. Can you believe that? Some of y'all remember when I had any, some of y'all remember when girls did nothing but say, eh, no, I've got to make ice cubes that night, you know, or I've, I've really got to floss my cat's teeth. I'd love to go out, but, you know, all of the excuses that they would give me. But now, here is what we've learned. Most of the people in that database were male, but it gets a little better. Go ahead and move forward one. The number of people with what's called a loopback or a home IP address, which I'll get to here in just a minute, which made us start questioning, okay, what is the makeup of this file? 12 million of them were male, 68 million of them were, or 68,000 of them were female. 12,000 male, 68,000 female. Go ahead and move forward one. Some of this will start to sound, I know for some of you, this is going to start sounding like the teacher in Charlie Brown, okay? Wah, 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 wah. Just bear with me, I promise, this is going somewhere. The number of people who checked their Ashley Madison messages, men were pretty good at checking their messages, okay, to see if something was going to happen. Women, about 1,492 across the country even checked their messages on the site. Move forward one. The number of people who used the Ashley Madison chat system, 11 million men, 2,400 ladies. Those were some busy ladies who were having to message all those 11 million men. But... Here's, here's some interesting things that came from that. Go ahead and move forward one. Well, and I'm sorry, you'll, you'll have to just punch for me. Okay, there are over 10,000 female accounts with email domains ending in ashleymadison.com. This piqued our interest. So, for example, 100 at ashleymadison.com, 200 at ashleymadison.com. Go ahead and hit it again. 68,709 female accounts were created with what's called a loopback or a home IP address of 127.0.0.1, which is the default home address of any computer. And some of us geeky guys have actually bought front doormats that say 127.0.0.1 suite 127.0.0.1. Some of you guys will get that later on. But here's what's interesting about all of this. The female accounts were fake. They weren't even real. As people start interpreting the data, they started realizing 
there really aren't even any women on the site. Oh, there were a few real ones, but for the most part, the company was creating online personas using their own email addresses so that the system would make it appear that there were a lot of women out there. And they even created fake images. Most of the images they created, they had a, a location in China that was creating um, profile pictures for these ladies that they would put out there. So guys, whoever the guys were chatting or talking with wasn't even real. They were just fake. Now, how's that make you feel? Go ahead and move forward. Uh, these account, a lot of the accounts, nearly 200,000 of them, with Ashley Madison, you could say, I don't want to be on here anymore, I want to delete it. They would be very nice to you and charge you a fee to delete your account. But most of the ones that they said that they took money for and said they deleted were still there. So they didn't really delete the accounts. Go ahead and move forward. Out of five and a half million female accounts, 0% showed activity. Now, this was a huge bit of news, and you could track. There was a blip last year of divorce filings because when all of this stuff comes out, all of these suspicious wives were able to, guess what, search and see if their husband is in there. And a lot of them found their husbands. And a lot of divorce, law divorce lawyers got rich in 2015 because of this. Go ahead and move forward. So here's the lesson. When you're online, you're walking through wet concrete, folks, and it hardens up, and, and you don't erase it. I, I, I don't know how to emphasize it enough. I know last week I went through a little bit about what we do and, and how we might erase things and stuff like that. The reality is it, it doesn't get erased. I mean, it is, without a doubt, something that stays around. It is something that will be out there, and even if you in this case, pay to delete your account, guess what? You have no verification that it was deleted. So I want you to be careful. I'm not sharing this with you because I think, oh, and we've also looked and found a lot of you guys here were in that. Day. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is there are things, people got real interested in this whole news event last year, and a lot of people didn't really talk about what the data really meant. Well, what the data really meant was this company had built a business on a lie and made a lot of guys across the country believe the lie and took a lot of money and screwed up a lot of marriages. Even, even where men got on it and then never had an affair and then said they wanted to get off of it, a lot of them lost their marriages over it. So please be aware. I just want you to understand, this stuff is real. This stuff happens all the time. Data breaches do occur. You've got to be careful. You've got to be very careful. My daughter and my son make fun of me because they think that I am just a little bit too out there about protecting data. I, you know, they will say, hey, I, and you've all lived through this, right, with your kids. Hey, what's my social security number? Really? And they'll send it to me in text. What's my social? Really? I'm not sending that whole thing to you. So I'm like sending random digits to them through different channels so that they can't be put together. I'm, I'm the guy who, who tries to encrypt everything that I do because I just see, it, for me, it's prudent. It's not, I don't have cans in my basement and, and enough water to live for six months. I don't have that, but I am somewhat protective about what I put online, and I use it a lot. Now, to be clear, before I jump into this next piece, I, a lot of people get torqued up, and usually it's those who, have, um, who are a little bit older than my age. A lot of people get real spun up about putting credit card information in online. Um, we, we had this happen when we rolled out online contributions at TV. Um, it, 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 we had to deal with a lot of folks and a lot of questions. Oddly enough, our contributions are up because we did that, because it just, the auto draft keeps going. Um, so, elders here, you know, you need to bump up the, anyway. Um, but one of the things that is interesting to me is people who will say, I'm not putting my credit card information in online. Okay, I get it. I understand that seems counterintuitive. But here's the reality. Here's where I found a little bit of peace. I feel way more comfortable putting a credit card number in an encrypted transaction online 
than handing it to some 19-year-old at a restaurant who disappears with it for 10 minutes. I mean, let's face it. Typically, when credit card data is breached, it is breached at the other end from an employee. It is rarely, if ever, captured in transmission. So if I can ease your mind about that, um, hopefully that's good. If not, I'll be gone after next week, so you won't have to deal with me anymore. Okay, um, let's jump into this. Uh, today I want to talk about um, pace. We started out talking about pace of change. Last week we talked a lot about social media. We talked a lot about the impacts on that and on our friendships. And today I've got 30 minutes, basically, to talk to you about pace. And to do that... Um, I need to give some thanks where thanks is due. So if you would move forward here, I want to uh, recommend a couple of books for you. Um, one is by Andy Stanley called Choosing to Cheat. Fantastic book. If you're interested in reading that, a lot of the information that I'm going to share today, I, um, I won't say that I stole or plagiarized, but um, I'm of the mind if I forget where I got it, it's mine. Um, so I'm, I'm attributing here, okay? So if Carolyn Josephson is in here anyway, I'm, I'm attributing. Is that good? Okay. And over on the right, a book by John Ortberg called The Life You've Always Wanted. Both of these fantastic books. Um, they're not new, but they are excellent. They are still very relevant. I highly recommend them. Um, so, I'm not sure about you, but sometimes for me, life just moves too fast. Or it feels like that. Life moves real fast. And we're into the holiday season now. And it always amazed me before I ended up with my 23-step commute that I live every day uh, from my bedroom to my office. Um, when I was working in a real office situation, I would get on the elevator after a, uh, after a holiday, and everybody just looked worn out. I mean, they just looked half dead. How are you doing? Oh, I'm worn out. I mean, holiday was supposed to be the time we were resting, right? What does it say about us when we have to go to work to relax. I mean, things have changed pretty dramatically. So when life hits the accelerator, we, we find that there are a lot of things that we will pay for to try and help us recapture time. We keep thinking the next device, you know, the next phone or the next tablet or whatever the next device is, is going to emancipate us, but it just enslaves us a little bit more. At least it feels like that. I mean, you look at lunch today. And when you go to lunch, you look across the restaurant and see how many families are not talking with each other, they're doing this, individually. Mom, dad, both kids, they're just looking down, checking everything. We, we have started adding so many things to what we do as far as our pace. And in the 60s, this kind of evolved a little bit by way of something that we've come to know pretty regularly. There was this uh, type of food not that was made famous. It wasn't made famous because of the quality or the price, but it was made famous because of how quickly you could get the food. And we call that what? Fast food. Exactly. I mean, you would go in, uh, you know, McDonald's really blazed the way for this. And now, you know, we, we moved from the 60s into the 70s, and that wasn't quite fast enough. Because, you know, even back in the 60s, when they blazed the trail for us, we still had to go in Still had to stand in line, had to order, then we had to wait for them to put a tray on the counter, and we had to pick up the tray and go find a seat, sit down, eat it, and then throw our trash away and go. So in the 70s, there was this amazing thing that happened that we created. Do you know what it was? The drive through absolutely, so that we could all feast in our minivans and Suburbans like God intended. I mean, it was just a, a beautiful thing that happened, and... I've seen a few of your vans, okay? I mean, I know that that beautiful invention allows you to also feed your kids when you don't have time to stop. You just tell them fish down in between the seat and grab a few fries that are down there and just nibble on those. I mean, I, I know what this looks like. So if you'll move forward one, Chad. So we, uh, years ago, City Corp became famous because they created something called the Halftime Mortgage they would write you a mortgage in half the time that it took for anyone else to write a mortgage, or half the time that you were accustomed to. Now, we did have this little housing crisis that came up, but put that aside, we got, we got mortgages quickly. Go ahead and move forward again. Denny's created the 10-minute lunch. You remember this? 
They had the little timers on the table, and then Bennigan's picked it up, and they would come in and say, okay, I'm putting your order in, and they'd hit the timer, and then they would go. And we would sit there. I cannot tell you how many times I would go to Bennigan's with one of my friends and sit there and watch that timer and think, we are so getting a free lunch. And at 9 minutes, 56 seconds, here they come. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? You made me wait nearly 10 minutes for this. I mean, I was just so mad about it. Go ahead and move forward again. Domino's Pizza really took off in the 80s because their motto was what? 30 minutes or it's... Yeah, 30 minutes or it's free. And, you know, they kind of had this issue in the 90s with a lot of wrecks and things like that. But in the early 90s, the Domino CEO comes out and he says something astounding. Marketing people called it genius when he first said it. He said, you know what, folks? We don't sell pizza. We sell delivery. Now, if you've eaten a Domino's pizza, you know he's right. I mean, that, that is exactly what they sell. They, they do not really sell pizza. Um, one, move forward one more. I, was, uh, I saw this story in USA Today, but I also actually saw it in real life. A few years back, I was driving through Detroit. I was following my standard practice of when I drive through cities like Detroit in a rental car. I roll the windows down so the bullets don't break the glass because that creates this whole issue of you know, losing the deposit and all that. But I was in Detroit. I was driving down the freeway. I was on my way to Southview. And I noticed a billboard for a hospital. And you've seen some of the newer billboards for ERs, X amount of minutes wait, you know, like 10 minute wait for the ER, which is never true, but you know, it, it's the reality. They're, they're advertising that. Well, this billboard honestly said, we will see you in 45 minutes or your visit is free. People raved about it. The story in USA Today was talking about how successful it had become. Now, mortality rates had gone up 300%, okay? <laughs> People were dying, but they were dying quickly, and so that was good, and everybody was happy with it. So, I mean, we, we will look, we will pay good money, we will do whatever we can to try and save a little bit of time. So go ahead and move forward, Chad. In 1967, something happened, and I'm going to point out uh, that that was before I was born, okay? I'm just saying it, because it's not often I can say that. But in 1967, and go ahead and hit it again, expert testimony, expert testimony was given before the U.S. Senate. And it, here are some of the quotes from that testimony. Technology, labor-saving and time-saving, will change the way Americans work. Do you agree with that? I mean, that's, that's happened, hasn't it? Okay. In 20 years, people will work an average of 32 weeks a year. Did we get there? How about this one? At that point, Americans will average 22 hours of work per week. The average American will retire by the age of 40. This is just getting better, isn't it? I mean, and within 20 years, the number one challenge Americans will face with regard to time is what to do with their excess time. Expert testimony before the U.S. Senate. Are you kidding me? I mean, this is something that we were promised, and what's happened is something that is the result of, well, it's Parkinson's Law. Go ahead and move forward one. Parkinson's Law was put out by a guy named uh, Cyril Northcote Parkinson, I believe. has nothing to do with the disease, but he published an article, hit uh, one more time, in The Economist that basically said, work expands to fill the time available for its completion. Now, let me, translate for, uh, let me translate that for you. If you have 40 hours you can work in a week, and you have some time-saving thing that comes along, and now you're doing 40 hours of work in 32 hours, what's going to happen? Work is going to expand and eat up that eight, uh, other eight hours you just freed up. And you know this is true. I joke with people when they call me, hey, do you have time to get on this call? Well, I've got between 3.30 and 4 a.m. available. Can, you know, could we do it then? I mean, it, it just expands. It starts to eat up whatever it can, and you see this in your houses, right? I remember when we moved, not to the house we're in now, but the, the house we were in in Indian Hills. We were moving from Sherwood into Indian Hills. We were just packed to the gills in Sherwood. We walked into that house in Indian Hills, which is still just down the street from Danny Sullivan. And we walked in and thought, you know, I heard angels. 
In fact, I saw a unicorn in the backyard because we had so much space. And I thought, we will never fill all this space. Do you want to know what my attic looked like when we left? I, I think that I was about to break code for how much weight was suspended in the attic. I mean, every amount of space you get will be filled. Every amount of time you save will be filled. And the reality is we are just trucking right along with it. Half the time we aren't even paying attention to it. I mean, it is something that is very real. Move forward one. Uh, there's a lady, an author by the name of Juliet Shore. Uh, she wrote a great book, uh, hit it one more time, called The Overworked American. And she made a lot of news. She, she got a lot of attention because um, she said that in the, over the last 20 years, instead of freeing up time with our technology advances, she said employees have added the equivalent of one full month of work to their life per year. And that's just outside the home, okay? Add to that all of the activities outside of work. I mean, you think about it, especially people with younger kids, ball games, practices, you know, recitals, on and on and on. All of the stuff you got to do for their school, for their fall carnival, or whatever it is that's going on. In fact, Shore sound, she found that the average husband today spends more time doing work around the house than the wife does. I just made that up. I, I, that's, she, she didn't really say that. I, I, you, you were looking at me so intently, and I thought, you know, I, I just, you were believing me, and I, and I couldn't let that, I couldn't do that. So, sorry about that. Everything I said before that line was true. Um, the result, what is the result of this? I mean, we're exhausted. And here's our reality. We have entered into a way of life that is toxic to the soul. And we don't even know it. It's just crept up on us. It's like we don't even realize how stressed and how crazed we have gotten. Uh, Newsweek inter interviewed a woman named Gretchen Rubin. This is in Chicago. And, and she said, uh, this is kind of interesting. This is part of the article uh, that was called Sleepless in America. I don't know if you remember this. This was back when Newsweek actually published a magazine every week. Now they only do it for certain special events. Um, Rubin's quote was, my idea of a vacation is going to the dentist. It may sound strange, but I just can't wait to go there and lay back and finally have one minute to relax. Now, if the highlight of your week is a root canal, something, something is definitely going wrong. A, a friend of mine, you know, that I worked at Axiom with, he, we all have our bags, you know, now I carry a backpack and we always have our computer in it, and, um, but he would always take his bag or his briefcase home with him, and he was telling me this seriously one day. He came home one day and his son his son said, hey, Daddy, why do you always bring your, your briefcase home? And his dad said, well, I, I just, I don't always get my work done at the office. And his kid was so sweet, he looked at him and he said, well, well couldn't they put you in a slower group? <laughs> I, I got to tell you, um, there are some cultural realities to this. Chad, move forward one. Um, when we talk about culture and velocity, culture teaches us that any unused minute is just poor time management. That's the unspoken phrase to all of us. M move it again. You like my clicker? I'm just saying, <laughs> move it again. Um, culture teaches that if you stop for a moment, you're going to be left behind. And a couple of others here. Um, the more culture can keep us moving at a frantic pace, the less we focus on meaningful things. And, and you felt this. The result is a generation of people who have low tolerance, small measures of grace, and real shallow relationships. And that's what we're living today. I mean, sadly, it's, it's one of these things that I think if we would just pay attention to some things, um, we would be blessed. And so I want to I introduce you to what I call the most violated command. Um, there's this list, you know, the top ten list, the Ten Commandments, that a lot of people talk about. 
But there's one we've just kind of thrown off to the side because, well, that's the old law. You know, we, we, never mind if it made sense, that's the old law, so we're not going to do it. Well, I'm, I'm going to say some things today that um, I hope you don't hear what I'm not saying. But I do want you to hear the intent behind them. Out of Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Now, this is a bit of an eye chart, but I'm just going to try and read it, see if my contacts are working. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you will labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you will not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male or female servant nor your animals nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. And then on the next one, Chad, um, when God created this, going back to Genesis, on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from the work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all the work he had done in creation. Now, here's what is interesting to me. Aside from the fact that I'm sure Don Allen Frost knows a great camp song that he could sing for you about every day of creation, okay? Here's the interesting thing, and it took me nearly a lifetime to realize this. Look at how that's worded. On the seventh day, God finished his work. What was he creating on the seventh day? If he was finished on the sixth, why doesn't it say on the sixth day he finished his work? I've grown up my entire life hearing God worked six days and then he rested on the seventh. But when I reread this, it says on the seventh day God finished. What was he creating on the seventh day? I'd say, yeah, absolutely. I would suggest to you that God was creating on the seventh day. He was creating the Sabbath. He created rest on the seventh day. One of the things I think we're missing as a people, as a culture, as a society, as a world, is God built into the fabric of creation this rhythm, this sequence that is healthy. And we are violating that more than we are violating don't lie. We are violating that more than we violate don't covet. We are violating that, in my opinion, today. We couldn't say this back in the Mayberry RFD days, okay? But today, I think breaking the Sabbath, breaking that rhythm, is the most violated command of all of the Ten Commandments. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't walk out of here and say, I just said we've got to observe the Sabbath. That's not what I'm saying. But I am suggesting it's about time we observe a Sabbath, some kind of Sabbath in our lives. Now, I, before we go to this, Chad, I'm, I'm going to read, I want to read something to you to illustrate this. Um, any of you listen to uh, Bill Harley? He's a commentator on NPR. Good, neither do I. I. I don't listen to NPR. I probably should. I would probably be a better person, but um, I, I just don't. But he uh, had one segment that I heard that I just want to read to you, and I, I know you hate being read to, okay? So I'll try and do it fairly quickly. But just get this mental picture, because to me, this is a great picture of where we need to go. Last year, my younger son played t-ball. This is the bottom step on the 20-rung ladder leading to, the ma to Major League Baseball. The rules for t-ball are different in many ways from the Major Leagues. First, there are no agents. There's no reserve clause. You go to the team that chooses you. In fact, there are only two teams in the league with 25 kids on each team. Parents are friendly to each other, a civility that will dissolve in several years as the lottery for positions in the major league comes closer and closer. In t-ball, everybody bats, each inning, regardless of how many outs there are. In fact, an out is a rare occurrence. All 25 players play each inning and are littered through the field, forming a wall of humanity through which it is virtually impossible for a ball to pass. On each team, there's one player who insists on fielding every ball. Some of you are remembering that kid, aren't you? And then running after the base runner, never throwing it. Balls are never thrown, and if they are thrown, they must either go over the head of the intended recipient or hit them in the back. Every player who scores has hit a home run, no matter how many times the ball has been thrown into the outfield. No such thing as an error. In t-ball, kids have to go to the bathroom almost immediately. Parents go out into the field and console their children who have skinned their knees or bumped into their neighboring infielder. And of course, in t-ball, no one pitches. 
The ball sits on a plastic tee waiting for the batter to hit it, which happens once every three batters. Now, on the other team, there was a girl I will call Tracy. Tracy came each week. I know, since my son's team always played her team. She was not very good. She had Coke bottle glasses and hearing aids on each ear. She ran in a loping, carefree way, with one leg pulling after the other, one arm windmilling wildly in the air. Everyone in the bleachers cheered for her, regardless of what team their kid played. In all the games I saw, she never hit the ball, not even close. I sat there, it sat there on the tee waiting to be hit, and it never was. Sometimes, after 10 or 11 swings, Tracy hit the tee and the ball would fall off the tee and sit on the ground six inches in front of home plate. Run, yelled Tracy's coach, and Tracy would lope off to first, clutching the bat in both arms and smiling. Someone usually woke up and ran her down with the ball before she reached first, and everyone applauded. The last game of the season, Tracy came up to bat, and through some fluke or simply a nod toward the law of averages, she creamed that ball. She smoked it right up the middle through the legs of 17 players. Kids dodged as it went by or looked absentmindedly at it as it rolled unstopped, seemingly gaining speed, hopping over second base, heading into center field, and once it reached there, there was no one to stop it. Have I told you there are no outfielders in T-ball? Well, there are for three minutes in the beginning of every inning, but then they moved into the infield to be closer to the action or at least to their friends. Tracy hit the ball and stood at home, delighted. Run, yelled her coach. Run, screamed the parents. Tracy turned and smiled at us and then, happy to please, galloped off to first. The first base coach waved his arms round and round when Tracy stopped at first. Keep going, Tracy, keep going, go, and happy to please, she headed to second. By the time she was halfway to second, seven members of the opposition had reached the ball and were passing it among themselves. It's a rule in T-ball. Everyone on the defending team has to touch every ball. The ball began to make its long and circuitous route toward home plate, passing from one side of the field to the other. Tracy headed to third. Her coach stood at home plate calling her as the ball passed over the first baseman's head and landed in the field team's empty dugout. Come on, Tracy, come on, baby, get a home run. Tracy started for home, and then it happened. During the pandemonium, no one had noticed the 12-year-old mutt that had settled itself down in front of the bleachers five feet from the third baseline. As Tracy rounded third, the dog awakened by the screaming, sat up and wagged its tail as, as Tracy headed down the line. The tongue hung out, mouth pulled back in an unmistakable canine smile, and Tracy stopped right there, halfway home, 30 feet from a legitimate home run. She looked at the dog. She looked at home plate. Her coach called, come on, Tracy, come on home. He went to his knees behind the plate, pleading. The crowd cheered, go, Tracy, go, go. She looked at all the adults, at her own parents, shrieking and catching it all on video. She looked at the dog. The dog wagged its tail. She looked at her coach. She looked at home. She looked at the dog. And everything went into slow motion. She went for the dog. It was a moment of complete, stunned silence. And then, perhaps not as loud, but deeper, longer, more heartfelt. We all applauded as Tracy fell to her knees to hug that dog. Two roads diverged on a third baseline, and Tracy went for the dog. Here's, Here's what I want you to understand. Six days a week, we're rounding the bases. We're chasing it. We're chasing everything that we got to do. We are, we are at full tilt. Could we not just for, even if not one day, just a part of a day, could we not just go for the dog? Could we not just relax? 
I'm not saying give up a whole day and don't, you know, don't go into all the rules of, well, you know, you can't go get, you can go get water, but you can't tie this certain type of knot or whatever. I'm not, I'm not getting into all the rabbinical stuff. But could we not just give ourselves a little bit of a break every once in a while? Go ahead and forward it, Chad. There's a new Sabbath I want to propose. And that is to rest. We, we've got to recognize that when we don't have any Sabbath in our lives, we are violating this rhythm that God put in place. It's something that we are violating. Go ahead and move forward. When we violate the Sabbath, there are things that happen. I, I like to say we hydroplane through life. We hydroplane through our marriages. We hydroplane through our relationships, our jobs, through everything. Our lives have, are drained of compassion. And you've seen this happen. You know, people who are overtaxed, their hearts start to shrink. They start to lose uh, a little bit of just grace. I see it all the time in airports where people honestly believe that their status on an airline or at a hotel chain equals how people ought to treat them in normal life. We've got a big problem with that in this country right now. This tyranny of loyalty programs that have made us believe we're the most important thing out there. And companies treat us that way because they want us to keep coming back. But here's the reality. We're starting to believe our own press a little bit on that. Go ahead and move forward. Um, there was a guy named Abraham Heschel. He was a great Jewish writer on the Sabbath. And he said, six days a week we wrestle with the world, wringing profit from the earth. On the Sabbath, we especially care for the seed of eternity planted in our soul. The world has our hands but our soul belongs to someone else. Now stop there for a second, Chad, and let me, let me just share something as I wrap this up, because I, I know we're running out of time. Um, you guys remember The Wizard of Oz? Frank Baum's mythic tale. I don't know how many of you have uh, know the backstory on all of that. Some of you have read it. But in, in the full version of this, there is a woodsman who is completely in love with a maiden, loves her dearly. And this wicked witch can't stand their love. She just cannot put up with it. She is infuriated by it. And so while the woodsman is out cutting wood, she causes an accident to happen and cuts his arm off. So the tinsmith comes and creates a tin arm for him. And so he starts cutting one again, and he finds that he's so efficient with this tin arm, and then it, it, all it did was it made him love his, this maiden more because he decided, I'm going to build us a house. I'm going to build us a cabin. He starts cutting more and more wood, and so the wicked witch, even more frustrated by it, causes another accident to happen and cuts his other arm off. Now, this is not like the scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, okay, but you, you get the idea. And so the tinsmith comes and puts another tin arm on him. And now this guy is a machine. I mean, he is so efficient. He can cut more wood than he has ever cut before, and it is infuriating the wicked witch. And so finally, she causes another major accident to happen and just hurts his torso, and the tinsmith has to come and give him a tin torso. This is the creation of the tin man, if you haven't caught on. But in the process of that, he didn't, he didn't have a heart. So he was a machine. He was the most efficient woodsman on the earth. Here's my concern. I want to share with you one quote from um, a guy named John Eldridge. Go ahead and move forward one. This is, I promise, this is very near the end. He says, notice there was a man who was once real and alive and in love, but after a series of blows, his humanity was reduced to efficiency. He became a sort of a machine, a hollow man, at first, he did not even notice, for his condition made him an excellent woodman, as any person can become productive like a machine when he foregoes his heart. Here's my big concern. Everything that we do, and I'm not, you know me by now, I'm, I love technology, I love the devices, I love all of that, but if we aren't careful, we run the risk of becoming so efficient that we forego our heart. And the grace that would cause us to stop and help someone, very much like the story of the Good Samaritan, we will be one of those people who just walk on by because we're too busy. We're answering. We might not even notice them because we're texting. 
I have noticed, I've experimented with this. When I'm in New York City and I don't want people to talk to me when I'm walking down the street, whether I'm on a call or not, I'll hold the phone up to my ear. Nobody bugs you. If you don't have the phone up to your ear, people will ask you for money or anything else. It's like this little bubble <laughs> that is created around you. Go ahead, this is the last thing. Let me throw this out. I'm going to ask you, let's, let's establish a, sab a Sabbath rhythm in our life. I'm going to ask you to start with something small. I have started imposing a digital Sabbath on myself for part of one day a week. It's not long. It's like four or five hours. Okay? I'm trying to work up from that. But we have got to start some kind of digital Sabbath in our life. Start small. Choose a time. Choose a day. It doesn't have to be a Saturday, okay? I'm not resurrecting Old Testament Sabbath because I know all of our work schedules are all kind of crazy. But find a day and remember. Remember your creator. Remember what life is about. Let's not get so caught up so that we are just efficient machines. Let us not forego our heart. And I think that we can make a real impact not only on our lives but on this world. Let's have a prayer and then we'll be done. God, would you just slow us down every now and then? Would you train us to be content to spend some time seeking you? Would you fill us with the joy and the unbelievable blessings of what can happen when we do? Father, would you bless all of our lives? Father, you've given us just a tremendous blessing to live at this time with all of the blessings we have. Help us not to Help us not to let our heart or our grace shrink as a result. We love you and we pray this through Jesus. Amen.